On this episode of Cape Media News, the town of Barnstable helps track sharks, we take a look at the quest to reduce plastic use on Cape Cod, students celebrate STEM by playing arcade games, and we learn about a group working to provide sober space for recovering teens. These stories and more, this is Cape Media News. Hello everyone, this is Cape Media News, your local authentic newscast for Cape Cod. I'm Sarah Colvin. It's June, can you believe it? Summer is gearing up here on Cape Cod and we welcome the first Cape Flyer of the Year this past Friday. The Cape Flyer weekend train making trips between Boston and Hyannis is now running. The first train of the year arrived last Friday. A group of travelers were on the platform awaiting its arrival. Local musician Brandon Manter entertained the crowd. The train is now in its sixth year of service. It runs Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays through Labor Day. The Cape Flyer is a unique partnership between the Massachusetts Department of Transportation, the Cape Cod Regional Transit Authority and the MBTA. Find out more at Cape Flyer. Coming up next, STEM students celebrate success at Wackenhammer's Arcade. I learn a lot and I have a lot to work with now like how I'm not. I come in like with a blindfold and now it's gone. So I had more opportunity. I have more ways of doing things and I learn a lot. You know, my mentor Lauren, she she helped me to dream again. And uh, and that was such a huge thing because uh, because I had stopped it. And she uh, not only kind of gave me a little bit more direction, but she gave me a lot of hope. So my first experience with We Can, all I can say is, holy cow. <laughs> Science and fun meet at a local arcade. Gabrielle Rawson has the story. What does science have to do with arcade games? Turns out, everything. Every winter, the Cape Cod Regional STEM Network hosts a winter design challenge, and this year, the theme was cardboard. To celebrate, we met with two of the event winners from Miss Huff's 8th grade class at Wackenhammer's Arcade in Hyannis. My name is Sam Kersey. I'm in 8th grade, and I go to Mashpee Middle High School. Hi, I'm Colin Spencer. I'm in 8th grade, and I go to Mashpee Middle High School. We made a skee ball game. It was one of our favorite games in the arcades, and we thought it would be really cool to try and make one of our own. Wackenhammer celebrated the students' hard work by donating a day at the arcade for each winning team. I'm Andrew, one of the managers here at Wackenhammer's Arcade. Leslie and Joe, the owners, are MIT grads, and they have a strong emphasis on science and expanding the education and also making it fun for kids to be more involved. It's not just an arcade. Here, we're a STEAM museum. So we're a steampunk museum that focuses on STEM education. So above most of our pinball machines, we have posters explaining the science behind it. It's about teaching the kids as well as them having a good time. In addition to making a game out of cardboard, students were asked to explain the process to a panel of engineers. I thought it was gonna be really difficult to do, but it turned out like the tools we had to use it made it much easier than I thought it was gonna be. And Ms. Howe was really helpful in helping us make the, or helping us use the right tools and right uh, design to make the skee ball game. It was a lot of fun to make. For Cape Media News, I'm Gabrielle Rawson. Local eateries are working hard to reduce plastic waste. A Skip the Straw campaign is underway, one small step in reducing the enormous amount of plastics found in our oceans. Gabrielle Rawson reports on local efforts. 18 billion pounds of plastic end up in the ocean each year. We met with conservation experts to learn more. Well, hello, I'm uh, Richard Delaney. I'm the president of the Center for Coastal Studies 
and the center is a uh, an independent nonprofit research, education, and public policy organization. Our, our mission is to contribute our our knowledge about the oceans and the data we collect to decision makers to enable decision makers to make better decisions about sustaining and protecting and conserving oceans and coasts. People have to understand that you know plastic is a relatively new item in our world. It only came into existence commercially in the 60s. So we lived as a society and other countries lived without plastic for generations, for eons. And all of a sudden we created this supposedly this material that was going to make everyone's life easier. Problem is it doesn't biodegrade. It never goes away. We have had now increasing evidence that it's actually making its way into the food chain, not only impacting fish and whales and sea turtles, but eventually, and not eventually, already, potentially, making its way onto our dinner plates because we eat a lot of those same animals. The Cape, like almost every other part of the world, has its share of plastic pollution. Every few minutes, we as a society are using millions of plastic bottles one time only. Use it, put away someplace. Most of that doesn't get recycled. It ends up in landfills. Unfortunately, a significant percentage of bottles and straws and all of our plastic debris eventually make its way into the ocean. And that's the problem that we're trying to deal with here at the Center for Coastal Studies. Jill Talladay, founder of CARE, Creating a Responsible Environment, has started working with small business owner Catherine Bieri to reduce plastic consumption in her cafe. So this year we decided that we wanted to do something to really raise awareness um, more so. So we are working with the local restaurant businesses to educate them and ask them to stop serving plastic straws. We've always been wanting to look for an alternative when we opened up this store. So what we have done, we do take our straws and we put them behind the counter. We also have a poster over where the straws used to be, you know, explaining to people that we are part of the Skip the Straw campaign and, you know, giving them the statistics about um, the harmfulness to the wildlife and why we're participating. And for the most part, um, it's been a very positive impact to our customers and uh, quite a number of them will say, you know what, forget it, thank you, I don't need the straw. We actually rolled out the Skip the Straw program on Earth Day, so it hasn't been around that long. Um, we've, we've got about 25 restaurants so far that have committed to, to doing this. And um, what we're asking them to do is a couple of different things, one of which is to offer straws on request only, not to you know, make them available and not to put them into every single glass. Also, to replace the, the plastic straws with a paper straw, which does break down and, and isn't a threat to the sea life if they end up in the water. Um, and then also replacing things, um, we're, we're selling these metal straws that have uh, a, their own little cleaner, it's something that can be used over and over again, can be placed into the um, dishwasher. The, the billions of straws that are used every year by coast, a lot of them, coastal restaurants, which is a beautiful setting, you get your drinks, people take the straw out, put it in the table, the wind blows it off, it goes into the beach, next thing you know it's in the ocean. You know, it may not seem like much when one or two people do it, but when thousands or hundreds of thousands of people do it every day, the cumulative impact of that is significant. Well, the standard advice that you have probably heard is still very valid for everybody, individuals, businesses, government agencies, and that's to reduce the amount of plastic we use to begin with. We should reuse our materials as much as possible. So if you have a, even if you do use a plastic bottle, you can refill it several times and then recycle. If you do use plastic, when you're finished with it, manage it properly. People are, are not doing the wrong thing because they don't want to do the right thing. They just don't know. It's really about education. For Cape Media News, I'm Gabrielle Rawson. Coming up next, the town of Barnstable helps with shark tracking efforts. Hi, I'm Peter, and there's nothing I love more than sharing vegetables with my friends. Come on in! Help yourself to anything. That's why we give our food the utmost respect it deserves. Did you know there are simple steps we can all take to help save food? You can cook it, store it, even share it. Just don't waste it. Because when it comes to food, better ate than never. 
To learn more, visit savethefood.com. They're here, and local experts and officials are keeping an eye on them. We are, of course, talking about white sharks. Shark Watch 2018 has officially begun, and the town of Barnstable is helping researchers collect data. My name is Chris Nappy. I'm a natural resource officer for the town of Barnstable. Um, I've been a resource officer for about six years now. It's been two years that the buoys have been in, and we've had sharks both years. Um, so the first year, that was 2016, uh, we only had uh, just a few sharks, three or four, um, that came in late in the season, usually um, September and October is when they show up here. Um, and then last year, 2017, uh, we had, uh, I believe it was eight sharks show up, and those were uh, both September and October as well. They're kind of here for uh, about two weeks at a time, like one shark will show up and then it leaves, and then another one comes in and kind of hangs out for another week or so and then leaves as well. Um, so they're kind of like transient through here. They don't stick around too long. A few years ago, shark expert Dr. Greg Skomel asked Nappy for help filling a data gap. Greg didn't have any buoys in this part of Cape Cod Bay and, um, you know, we were more than happy to assist and help him uh, gather as much information as he can. As much data as possible is um, always a good thing. So we have three buoys that we deploy here uh, that we maintain. We'll deploy them the first week of June um, and they stay in usually till the first week of December. So one of them is placed uh, right out in uh, at the mouth of Barnstable Harbor, kind of uh, even with the Barnstable Harbor buoy, the BH buoy. Uh, there's another one placed um, right offshore of the Sandy Neck bathhouse, um, right off the public beach there. And then there's another one placed in Sandwich, um, kind of right off of Town Neck Beach. When tagged sharks swim near a receiver, an acoustic ping lets officials know they're nearby. We don't know if we'll have more or not, but um, it's always good to know if they're there or not. And, you know, it's not real-time data. We get this data that we upload um, usually on a monthly basis with um, a member of the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy. We take them out and we'll upload that data, but um, so it's always kind of a guess. We never really know when they're going to show up or when they're going to leave. It's all about educating the public, letting them know, you know, we can answer them if, if they ask us. If we do have sharks here, we can say, yes, we do have sharks here. Um, they're in, you know, we detect them in these places. So so just take the necessary precautions and, um, you know, just kind of be aware that they're um, swimming with, uh, potentially with sharks. For Cape Media News, I'm Gabrielle Rawson. The opioid crisis continues to affect us all on Cape Cod, and one local organization is working to help teenagers recovering from addiction. Recovery Build is a new sober space for teens. It's on Main Street in Hyannis. They're working to help provide a safe place for recovering teens to stay sober. We welcome uh, founder Stephanie Briety and recovery counselors Amanda McGarrigal and Megan Perry from the organization in studio this week to talk about the organization and an upcoming fundraiser. Yeah. Uh, Stephanie, wanted to start with you. Tell me a little bit about uh, why you wanted to uh, to found this organization. So um, Recovery Build in particular um, addresses a need on Cape Cod that we've, we've seen for a long time um, for young people, for teens who have substance use challenges and may or may not have gone into treatment um, and come back to the high school and the people and places and things that um, really kind of facilitated their substance use in the first place. And I actually, Behavioral Health Innovators has been working with teenagers um, for the two and a half years we've been in existence. And we had a, a youth summit um, in May last year and really asked the students there, high school students and middle school students came to uh, Four Seas College um, and really asked them, you know, what was going on, what they needed. And what they kept saying is they need space. They need their own space. Mm -hmm. Um, to talk and support one another around these issues. So Recovery Build really came out of um, a program that started in the 70s down in Houston, Texas, and they were called um, Alternative Peer Groups. And they existed in um, neighborhoods, in church basements, and they were sober, um, sober fun activities for young people, as well as 12-step meetings. And we really didn't have anything like that. We don't have that in the Northeast at all. So. Um, that's how Recovery Build was born and found these two amazing uh, women to um, create the program with us and we're really thrilled uh, Wonderful. about the program. So let's talk a little bit uh, more about the program and again getting teens together and having them have their peers to talk to one another is so very important. Um, so let's start uh, with you Amanda as, mm -hmm. as a counselor. Um, tell me a little bit about your background, what you drew you to this program and the kind of things that you do with, with Recovery Build. Sure. Um, <clears throat> 
I've been on Cape Cod the last 15 years. Um, I got my master's degree from Boston University four years ago. And um, with that, I became a licensed clinical social worker. And I've been working with teenagers since about 2010. I was working at a residential home. And I realized that um, when these children were placed, that we could spend a lot of time um, skill building and they could be with their peers. But then the minute they were not placed anymore, they kind of went back to the way everything was. So um, when I heard about this job starting, you know, the alternative peer group to give teenagers a safe place where they could be, you know, sort of act their age and um, have a place where they could be, we could be non-judgmental and compassionate and they could speak to one another, you know, in general terms. Wonderful. And Megan, mm -hmm. for you. Yeah, I mean, I've been a recovery coach for a number of years. I really, really enjoy helping people just find what their path of recovery looks like. Um, and that can take many different forms. And I think that um, sometimes we underestimate what a teenager can sort of bring to their own journey. And uh, I love to empower people, and especially, again, teens. We don't mm -hmm. always give them as much credit as I think that they deserve. So I think it's, it's really great for me because I love teenagers and I love their new perspectives and all that. I really appreciate that about them. So I just love having them in that space and sort of creating a space for them to just be themselves, for them to be able to express themselves, um, to talk to other teens that have you know, a similar journey to walk. Uh, and I find it, I just find it really exciting to see what the possibilities are for people of that age group that maybe they don't have to go as far down the road as, as some other people have with mm. substance use disorder, you know, if we can address it early, then it's like they just have so much potential and so many wonderful attributes and we want to celebrate that and, you know, encourage them. And So Monomoy High School in Harwich uh, on June 23rd, uh, 11.30 to 1.30, uh, Yogi's Unite for Recovery Build. What's going to happen at this fundraiser? That's a great question. <laughs> that, well, there will be an all levels um, yoga class. And when we say all levels, that you know, accessible to anybody. And there are four teachers um, from the studio, uh, Power Yoga Cape Cod. I'm one of the teachers, Jill Abraham, Susanna Vanderwend and Lee Alberti um, will be teaching mm -hmm. kind of a round robin. And there will be um, prizes and um, you know opportunities to meet the sponsors. We have a number of um, sponsors already that are excited of the, about the project. And it'll be a place for families and teenagers mm -hmm. to come and just really connect and there'll be other resources for families there. And hopefully, you know, it'll be a place for teenagers to try at a yoga class. Wonderful. And really, um, I, I think it's great that you have uh, the four different teachers so you can kind of get a sense of these different styles. And I've taken classes with some of these teachers before. They're amazing. <laughs> um, and uh, just the fact that it's uh, in kind of entry level yoga, all levels, so you can come and you don't need to do a handstand. Correct. Um, <laughs> or anything like that um, to be able to do that. So how do people get tickets uh, for this event? That's awesome. So they would go on the um, Dennis Port, Power Yoga of Cape Cod Dennis Port workshops page and sign up for the event. And it's a $50 donation that's um, recommended. And all of the proceeds goes to Recovery Bill to support us um, this year and to continue um, the project, you know, in the years to come. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of Cape Media News. Be sure to visit us online at capemedia.org. You can find past episodes in individual segments and our brand new video section. For Cape Media News, I'm Sarah Colvin.